correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're a farmer, aren't you supposed to be excited when spring gets here and you get back into a tractor for the first time in 34 months? I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? I'll tell you one thing, uh, that's not the way I'm feeling this year. Man alive, what a beautiful day. And with beautiful weather, we're going to put the uh, shop work on hold for a little while because we got to get the field and we got stuff to do. Uh, Andy and Kelly are actually out spraying what today. We finally got our uh, sprayer back and about five, six days late on a post-emergence weed application, the six site application, but they're getting it done. In the meantime, we're getting our hooded sprayer ready to go to uh, spray burn down strips. I'm not having to work by myself today though. Got Carter uh, in there on spring break. Looks like he's just playing around instead of actually getting this thing ready to go. What are you doing? Come on, man. I ain't paying you just to amble around the shop. Anyway, what he's done, he's already gotten my uh, drop nozzles on. We gotta take them off whenever we're uh, you know, spraying cotton in July. Otherwise, the uh, cotton rolls drag these, so we got to take them off. So he's getting all these on. We're about to put some water in there. Pray that I winterize the system properly, and uh, it should uh, give it a grease, and it should be ready to go. None of those tips going to leak, are they? What acting like you embarrassed to be on camera? That's Andy and Kelly here on the radio. They're getting wrapped up uh, spraying wheat. But yeah, back to my earlier comment. Uh, I'm, by, I'm about the le least excited I've ever been to put in a crop in my career. And I've kind of alluded to this in uh, a couple previous videos that uh, you know the prospects for this year are just not very exciting. Uh, dealing with high input prices you know, we've seen uh, the cost of stuff go up uh, even more than what it was last year, especially like seed. Uh, some chemicals have gone down, some chemicals have gone up. Uh, fertilizer, some of it's a little down, some of it's a little up, but you know, seed is a pretty big increase in price. But what, but what we have seen is, uh, uh, for the most part, our crop prices, you know, not really in the tank, but uh, they, they're easing that way every day. Uh, you know, corn, soybeans, and wheat have just been in just a uh, been in a steady, steady decline for many months now. And you know, right now for uh, you know, delivery this fall, we're looking at close to four dollar corn. And with uh, you know the input cost that it costs to raise corn, you know, uh, four dollars a bushel ain't going to do a good job of cutting it this year. You know, soybeans are still at a decent price, but down significantly what they've been. I think they're somewhere around eleven and a half, twelve dollars a bushel. And there's a chance to make make money on soybeans. Uh, cotton is the one bright spot right now. Old crop cotton is at a very high level. Uh, new crop cotton that we'll produce this year has not followed old crop cotton. Hopefully, it will. Uh, but it's you know it is looking good. But not everybody around here is a cotton farmer. Only a select few of us, and then. Wheat, uh, you know, it's about like corn. It's uh, it's not completely in the toilet, but it, it's not at a very attractive price for what it costs to, to produce. So, but anyway, uh, we only get a chance at income once a year, and it's not like we can just delay production until uh, prices come back up. You know, we're on a very uh, strict time frame, and uh, you know, when it's time to get this stuff done, we got to do it. Either that, or we just don't produce a crop for the year. And the second factor is, is, you know, we're coming off of our best year ever. I mean, last year was a phenomenal year in all crops except for wheat. And how, how are we supposed to top what we did last year? You know, it's, I'm not going to say it's impossible, 
But there's a lot of things that came together last year that were beyond my control that were very positive for us. And to have all the stars align again this year like they did last year, I mean, it, you know, it really only happens once or twice in a farmer's career. Is there a chance it could happen again uh, this year? Yeah, there's always that chance, but uh, very unlikely that it will. Uh, and, you know, I'm pretty hard on myself on how I judge, judge success. You know, I've always kind of defined my success by doing better than what we did last year, producing more bushels, more pounds, or doing it for a lower cost, uh, making more money than what we did last year. And that's kind of how I judge my success from year to year. Am I getting better at my job? Are we becoming more successful? And with the prospects that we're facing this year, you know, it's going to be next to impossible to top what we did last year. So it's a, it's a mindset thing that I've got to adjust. You know, uh, I need to start defining my success by how well we've adapted to the situations that we faced that year and how well do we deal with them as far as making the right decisions to, to maximize how much uh, profit that we're able to make with the hand that we've been dealt. So, you know, my current way of thinking has kind of been ingrained in me and you know, it's, it's, it can be tough to change your way of thinking to something different. But anyway, what we're out here doing today, if you've been following us for uh, for a year or two now, you know, you're no stranger to what we're doing. You know, we're doing our annual burn down strips in our cover crop to where we are, uh, to where we're killing an eight inch wide band uh, in our cover crop that we will plant directly into while allowing the uh, rest of the cover crop to continue to grow and accumulate biomass, sequester carbon, recycle nutrients, just all the good things that plants do to the soil. And uh, I'm not gonna dive too much, too deep into this because I've done it in previous years, but you know, that basically what we're doing is uh, getting all the benefits of having high biomass cover crops in our fields. But when it comes time to actually plant our cash crop, it's as easy as planting no-till if I can keep my planter uh, within those bands that we have killed. And to do this, we're uh, logging all of our guidance lines with RTK. Actually, I'm reusing guidance lines from past years. So we're spraying right now, and then we will plant directly on top of our old rows. And we've been doing this since, I don't know, maybe 2018, 2019 and it has been a game changer for us as far as being able to uh, maximize the biomass with our cover crops but still stand a real good chance of getting a good stand of our cash crop especially cotton so what we're using is our uh, wilmar uh, 12 row hooded sprayer we modified it to uh, shut off the tips spraying underneath the hoods which is what it's typically used for and we added some, uh, and we added, and we had some drop nozzles in between the hoods to spray the row in between the hoods while using the hoods to protect the cover crop in the middles to where we don't terminate it. Anyway, it's kind of a slow process spraying a 38 foot wide swath at five miles an hour, but it is absolutely critical to our system and ensuring that we get all of this expensive seed that got even more expensive this year getting it into the ground where it stands its best chance of coming up and producing a good crop while also utilizing the cover crop to you know really suppress weeds and provide fertility to the cash crop couldn't have asked for a more beautiful day to spray wheat absolutely gorgeous and look at this wheat it's just looking so green healthy it's gorgeous all right so the reason that uh we're parked over here is because andy last night finished up here he took the water truck home matt and i had the madison county nrcs banquet and since matt is on the board we went um the reason we are spraying wheat is for aphids and for any broadleaf uh, weeds that are out here. It's looking really good though. So this was cotton last year and while we were harvesting the cotton Andy was loading the chicken litter into the spreader so that it would be spread before Matt planted wheat. So I want to show you something. This is where the pile was. This is where Andy was loading. Do you see a difference in the wheat? 
this is where he was loading the bucket. Can you see a difference? I don't know, can you? As I, I think I can. Look at that. And this is a hilltop, okay? So he was loading the spreader right here. And look at how green and lush this weed is. Look at this. You can't tell me. I'm sorry. Your argument is invalid that chicken litter does not work because clearly it does. It works. Now, yes, it is a little windy out here, but it is not at the threshold that we can't spray. It's just, I'm out here with no trees. Um, last I checked, it was like eight to nine miles an hour. So we're good. Uh, we also have a, a juvet in there, so helps. But if it gets up to 15, we can't spray. It's not supposed to, I think the worst it's supposed to be is gust to like 12 miles an hour. So we'll be good. Um, I'm about to head over to the next farm, fill him up, and then we're gonna head out to Madison County hoping to be done by sometime after lunch. I don't know why he's over there. Is that the last that you have done or you still gotta go back behind her house? <laughs> he's gonna stop and talk to me. Hello, Andy. Uh, this is the last pass right here, but my pump is shutting off and shutting on. And I keep turning it off and it keeps shutting off. How much does it say you have left in the tank? 11 gallons. Well, crapola, I guess when you're just, I guess we'll just fill up here then. But anyway, this winter has been one of the most mild winters that I've ever experienced and definitely close to one of the driest winters we've ever experienced. I mean, we're out here almost the middle of March and I mean, we got soil moisture, don't get me wrong. It's not bone dry, but as far as the ground being firm, normally this time of year, the ground is saturated and we're having to really pick and choose when we get in the field so we don't make a mess. Uh, there's no problem getting in the fields right now. We could come in here with any equipment right now and the fields are fit. So it's really another reason I'm kind of concerned for this year. Uh, we, we got ample uh, subsoil moisture, but if it continues to remain dry this spring, you know, we could deplete some of that moisture we need for our cash crop before we ever even plant our cash crop. If you look at the drought monitor index, for the country, uh, uh, a lot of the big production in the U.S., especially up through the Midwest, is uh, uh, showing up on the drought monitor. So that's a big reason why we're still going to plant corn, even though the prospects right now on paper don't look like much chance of profit. If we have any kind of production issues in the U.S., uh, that price for the corn it could go up in a hurry, and that's kind of what I'm banking on. You know, you look up through Missouri, Missouri Iowa, on into Illinois, uh, they're actually in a drought right now. And what that will do, that will lead to a very quick plant, planting pace, but if there's any kind of uh, moisture shortage in the, in the summer during the growing season, uh, that could really drive up uh, corn prices because they don't have the subsoil moisture right now to carry them through as they normally would. So kind of what I'm banking on and kind of what I found out in the past you know what looks good or looks bad on paper in February when you're doing your projections very rarely actually becomes the case in September October November when you're actually doing your harvesting because there's so many things that we can't predict so right now not looking like we're gonna make any money on corn we're still gonna plant it because I think uh, at some point this year we're gonna have some really good pricing opportunities that's going to allow us to make a profit on corn. And a lot of these farmers, uh, you know, they're shying away from corn this year and kind of condensing uh, their eggs in, into one one or two baskets rather than uh, multiple baskets. And uh, that I don't want to do that. I want to spread my risk around. And the more crops we can plant, uh, the more we're going to spread our risk around. Now come September, I might be singing a different tune. Oh, I wish I didn't plant no corn. I mean, all I'm doing is losing money. Even with a good crop, I'm losing money on it. And, but, you know, we don't know that. I'm not a magician. And the crystal ball I picked up at Dollar General, it just don't seem to work too well. So anyway, we got about 550 acres of uh, cotton ground that we need to spray our burn down strips on and then if I got time, uh, I'd like to do some corn ground too. I've shown about a one to two bushel increase in yields where I've been able to do it on, on corn ground. And uh, if I got the time, we'll try and do a little bit of it also. Activities in the field! We have activity! 
Man, that's a nice basketball goal. That's all right. Look at this, y'all. This is what happens when you farm in the city. You find awesome. Oh, man, that's mint. That is mint, Andy. Mint to be. Yeah, we're about to use this. It's what? I don't care. We're about to use it. This is going to be field activities, bro. <laughs> Yes! I'm excited. This is going to be great. The Leaning Tower of Smith Family. <laughs> I mean, we can make it work. I think we can make it work. <laughs> you can tell they came and dumped because they turned around. That manhole covers off. They probably ran into it at night when they decided to just let it go. I mean, we might as well use it. This is the joys of farming in the city. They just don't care. So we are on our last 25 acres. We're here on the farm that's in the corner. And loving this new entrance that we have. So you can't see it, but uh, it's right here. Yes! So we start at the bottom and then I can drive and just come straight in. So, but on the way out, I'm gonna do a straight shot across the street like we used to, but man, that makes life so much easier. Winning at this today. Well, we are officially done spraying wheat, so it's time to park this water truck. I've got to run to the house, take a shower, and get ready to drive to Munford. About an hour from here, because Matt and I are going to be on a very awesome podcast. So, more on that later on. Well, finally, after three years of begging, we finally got some action. Uh, I hate to see a new power pole out here, but see this line up here? Uh, it was really low, and uh, last time we had cotton on this farm three years ago, uh, to pick this part, I'd have to like uh, pick up to the power line back up and do this back and then on the other side I'd have to do this because I couldn't get my cotton picker under the power lines, but uh, Gibson Electric finally got it rectified. I was really just wanting a taller pole right here where the existing one was. I wasn't wanting a new pole, but they deemed it necessary to put a, another pole there, but uh, at least don't have to worry about uh, catching those power lines anymore, even though we are going to have to uh, maneuver around this extra pole. Uh, Last thing you want to do is catch a cotton picker on a power line, you'll burn it to the ground. Uh, and, then, and then the very bottom wire is an internet wire, and when they strung that up like four years ago when we finally got a high-speed internet, that really lowered the clearance. So uh, it's bad enough if you cause an accident to cause people to lose, lose electricity, but you cause people to lose the internet, you might just start World War III down here around Mason Mason Grove. You know, yesterday I was talking about how this could be a, a difficult year, that every decision that we make is crucial just because of the uh, markets and everything else, low prices that we might might get this year. And I uh, got to thinking, I was less listening to a podcast that kind of uh, put me onto this, but you know, I'm getting ready to put in my, I think it's my 18th crop. So I've got 17 years of prior experience, which seems like a lot for a farmer. But when I've only had, you know, 17 chances to actually put a crop in, when you think about experience and making the right decisions and getting everything right, just how incredibly difficult that is, because I've only done this 17 times before. I've only had 17 times to learn from my mistakes. Whereas, say you look at any other profession, like if you needed major surgery, would you want to only go to a doctor that had performed that surgery 17 times before? Would you only want to carry your uh, pet to a veterinarian that's uh, treated an animal 17 times before? No, you want somebody who has a lot of experience. Would you want to be flying a commercial airplane that the pilot has only flown that plane 17 times before? No, you wouldn't. You know, in reality, in my lifetime, you know, I might only be able to put in, say, just say 40 crops by the, by the end of my career. So we're doing a very difficult job with just a small fraction of the experience in doing our job that most any other career in this world offers. 
So while, yeah, I do feel like that. I mean, we've got a very good handle on what we're doing and what we need to do. You know, we don't have the wealth of experience in making sure we get everything right that just about every other career offers with greater experience because we only get one chance a year to do you know a certain aspect of our job and either learn and and, and learn learn from it to make mistakes and be able to correct those mistakes so i hope that just kind of puts into perspective the nature of farming and just how incredibly difficult it can be when you look at it in terms like that Not again. This is like the 25th time this has happened this morning. No RTK, but everything looks like it's functioning properly. <laughs> but for whatever reason, every round or half round, sometimes twice in one pass, I lose RTK. And then I gotta just like wander around the field until it picks it back up and i don't know what the problem is because it's not with the receiver because i can uh, change it over to was and it picks it up perfectly immediately so the problem has got to be with the rtk modem I've had my guy at h &R on it all morning. He hadn't been able to figure it up other than maybe my modem is going out. Oh, it looks like lunch has arrived. Maybe I'll pick up RTK while I'm eating here. There we go. Finally got it back. Now with any luck, we'll get back here to start our pass without losing it again. This morning has been extremely freaking frustrating because, you know, there's a lot of jobs that we can do without GPS and we definitely want to have it, but we can't, if we need to, we can get it done. We, for the most part, we can plant, you know, we can spray. Uh, this right here is the one job I cannot do without GPS because I'm laying out the rows for our cotton crop right now and there's no markers on this hooded sprayer so I can manually know where the next pass is in some places if I lose GPS just like I lost it right now I can see where the corn rows are right here but that's not the case over the entire field you know we've got cover crop that's getting as close to as tall as a lot of the corn stalks and then of course the corn stalks were run over by combine grain buggy uh, and then the drill planting the cover crops so a lot of places i can't really tell exactly where the row row is and manually trying to plant into an 80 inch wide strip is is very hard to do i can do it especially on straight passes we start getting curved passes the uh, inroads and stuff it's very very hard to stay keep the planter unit within that eight inch wide gap and just watching my screen right here i mean it knows where i'm at in the field but it doesn't have the correction level available to actually run the auto steer which is what i really need so you go to hit it now so you cannot engage automatic gps correction does not allow it right now so we need that box right there to say rtk which gives us sub inch accuracy now, I'm going to drive around again until it picks it up. And we are not going to get anything done today working like this. Well, we finally uh, got through with the other farm we was on. My GPS issue seemed to have uh, gone away. I don't know, maybe we was getting some kind of cell phone interference or something over there. I don't know what's going on. But anyway, we got over here on Ferguson Farm and remember back last fall, we run the Ripper and uh, this is the farm I run the Ripper on the most and uh, trying to see some differences, uh, you know, from where, where we did the ripping. And, you know, it's kind of hard to tell, but one thing I definitely am noticing over here is look at that clover. <laughs> 
I mean, it's, it's, the clover is outgrowing the grass in some spots. You know, I've never, I've always kind of had problems growing good looking clover, getting it to nodulate and ev everything. Uh, you know, some clumps just don't look all that well while others have looked pretty good. But this over here, I mean, look out there, there you see all those dark green clumps. That's, that's that crimson clover. And I mean, the only difference between this and what I've done in the past and then other fields this year is the ripping. I don't know if maybe it got more, uh, it's getting more oxygen down to the soil, really letting that, uh, really letting that nitrogen producing bacteria on the roots of the clover, just really let, making it thrive and producing a lot of nitrogen, making that clover uh, really take off and grow. I, I just don't know, but I mean, uh, the clover on this farm is really looking impressive. Uh, taking a look at the grasses, uh, the grass looks about like it always does. I mean, it doesn't have a lot of nitrogen. Uh, you know, it doesn't look all that Im impressive. You know, it will take off and grow this spring and we will get good biomass out of it. But, you know, it's very, very rare that I see clover, you know, out competing the grasses. And that's kind of what we're seeing right here on this farm where, where we ripped. And another thing I'm noticing kind of look out there you see all those white flowers uh that's the daikon radishes that we planted that actually survived the winter and is now trying to go into reproductive mode and produce seed and normally daikon radishes don't overwinter here in west tennessee uh, normally you get uh two to three consecutive nights of around 17 degrees and the uh, daikon radishes winter kill uh, we definitely had that this year. I mean, heck, we had several nights that was down there around zero degrees. And then all of our other fields, uh, daikon radishes have, uh, the daikon radishes have winter killed. You look out there here, I see a whole lot of flowers. Uh, there's not many radishes right here in this field that died this winter. So again, the only difference is the ripping. I don't know how the ripping made a difference on that, but it's the only difference, so I don't know. So anyway, I mean, it's hard to tell, uh, you know, if it's really going to be a net agronomic effect. I do believe that it will be because we really had some serious issues on this farm. You know, we had a fragile pan just almost right beneath the soil surface. This is probably one of my poorest farms, uh, shallowest soils, most poor soils, and one we've really been working on uh, trying to build up. And it's just really been a very slow process. We have made good strides, but we still got a long ways to go on this farm. So we were just trying to jumpstart that by running the ripper over the worst parts of this farm. And based on the way the clover looks, uh, radish is surviving. I mean, I don't know, I, I think we did some good. But only time will tell once we get cotton planted out here and see what it looks like this summer. If we have some uh, knockout uh, cotton yields on this farm, uh, that'll sure enough be, uh, be good proof. I will say one big downside to this ripping. <laughs> My fields ain't near as smooth as what they was before. They wasn't terribly smooth to begin with, but now they, they, they kind of rough. And, I mean, I know ultimately the best thing to done would be to come back after ripping it with a leveling tool like a disc and a do all. But the last thing I want to do is tear up the top surface of the soil more than I'd already done because that's where all your water infiltration is. And you destroy that soil structure, then you kind of got to start over from scratch on building it back to be able to get that maximum water infiltration. And on a farm like this getting as much water into the soil as you can when it rains is key because you don't have a whole lot of water hold capacity and you don't want any of that water running off the field so uh you know we we just want to live with it being being rough we should make higher yields with a rougher field than what we would have made with a smooth field so hopefully uh over the course of the next several years uh, this this cloudiness that's real rough uh Hopefully it just kind of uh, you know washes down and, and smooths out a little bit, I'm, I'm hoping. So I got a big old pile of litter right there. We're gonna have to get started spreading on before too much longer. All right, it's getting late in the day on day two and we uh, getting close to calling it quits. Can't spray this round up real close to sunset. Otherwise it just doesn't have real good activity. But I noticed uh, we got over there this field where I ripped the inroads in this field but the main part of the field, I didn't rip. You can kind of see uh, right along through here, I ripped on this side, did not rip on this side. Now look at the clover right here. I mean, 
it looks uh, fantastic. And then look right over here. <laughs> Doesn't look so fantastic. I really don't know how the ripping uh, really helped the clover, but it did something. Uh, loosened the soil up. And I don't know really how that benefited the clover. More oxygen to the microbes or produce the bacteria or just letting the roots proliferate a little bit more or release some nutrient that the clover really liked. I, I don't know, but it did something. So this is gonna be a year long observation for us, but we're already seeing some in our cover crops uh, that could be pretty positive. You know, if, if all the rest of the clover in uh, my field look like this right here, then, I mean, that could potentially reduce my nitrogen needs on cotton by probably at least another 20 pounds an acre, be or, or you know, around what 10 to 13 dollars an acre, just depending on what the price of nitrogen is going to be. So, uh, this is something we're going to continue to study real close for the rest of the year. So, anyway, I'm gonna run the rest of my tank out. We're just about done for the day, and uh. We got several more days of doing this, but y'all seen this enough in the past. Nobody really likes spraying videos anyway, so uh, we'll bring you back whenever we get into something I think y'all be interested in. So appreciate y'all watching. See you in the next one.